The idea that unknown extraterrestrial beings are clandestinely visiting the Earth for hidden purposes is, quite plainly, horrifying. Yet, if the following cases are to be believed, then that may very well be precisely what is happening. Whilst it is terrifying to consider the intentions of alien beings, who possibly observe and perhaps even abduct us, with little to no intention of communicating, it is even more frightening to consider how those they are tampering with are the very people we rely on to keep us safe. It was May 1951. The Korean War had been raging for a year, and US Army Private First Class Francis P. Wall and his regiment was stationed around 60 miles north of Seoul, near Chorwon. In time, the area became known as the Iron Triangle, due to the heavy conflict that took place there before the armistice was signed two years later. And, if Wall is to be believed, in addition to human combatants, the conflict may have also involved extraterrestrials. Talking about his experience later, during an interview with John Timmerman, an associate of the J. Allen Hynek Center of UFO Studies, Wall explained that his regiment were preparing to bombard a nearby village. It was night, and they were located on the slopes of a mountain above the village. The men of the regiment were active, warning local civilians of the coming bombardment. According to Wall, it was then that they suddenly noticed what appeared to be a jack-o'-lantern come wafting down across the mountain. At first, no one thought anything of the object. It had an orange glow and moved quickly. Wall described how it continued on down to the village, where it passed through the center of artillery airbursts without being harmed. This lasted for about 45 minutes to an hour. It wasn't until the object approached the regiment that Wall and others supposedly started to question what it was. In his interview, the soldier claimed that the once orange light transformed in color. It turned a blue-green brilliant light. Pulsating, it continued to approach. Unsure as to its purpose and worried that it may have sinister intentions, Wall received permission from his company commander to fire upon the object. He stated that he must have hit it, as he could hear when the projectile slammed into it. Strangely, where the artillery rounds had left the object unharmed, Wall's armor-piercing bullets clearly affected it. From his description, the object supposedly went wild, moving erratically, its light going on and off. At one point, it appeared as though it might crash to the ground. All the while it made a sound which they had not previously heard. Wall described it as being similar to the sound of diesel locomotives revving up. According to Wall's testimony, it was at that moment that the object attacked. In his words, we were swept by some form of a ray that was emitted in pulses, in waves that you could visually see only when it was aiming directly at you. That is to say, like a searchlight sweeps around and you would see it coming at you. When the ray pointed at Wall, he felt a burning, tingling sensation all over his body, as though something were penetrating his skin. Terrified, Wall and his fellow soldiers supposedly retreated into their bunkers. Through peepholes, he and another man he was sharing the bunker with watched as the object hovered over them for a while, illuminating the whole area with its light. Then it shot off at a 45 degree angle. It was gone. At the time, Wall and the others in his regiment assumed that that was the end of the peculiar incident. However, three days later, the entire company of men had to be evacuated by ambulance. During his interview, Wall claimed that wider roads had to be cut to make way for the transport needed to haul them out. Supposedly, the men were too weak to walk and had dysentery. When doctors inspected them, they found that they had an extremely high white blood cell count, which the doctors could not account for. In the aftermath of the strange object and the mysterious mass illness which struck the regiment, whether or not a report should be filed was a source of contention. Despite it being standard practice for a company report to be filed each day, 
the consensus of the regiment was that the details of the incident should be withheld from their superiors. They'd lock every one of us up and think we were crazy, explained Wall. At the time of his interview in 1987, Wall could still not offer an explanation as to what he thought the object was. He did, however, explain that he suffers from periods of disorientation and memory loss, seeming to suggest that this was a direct result of his encounter with the object in 1951. Perhaps surprisingly, PFC Wall is not alone in his claim of strange objects in the skies over Korea. There are several reports from Air Force pilots and other soldiers of similar objects being encountered. Most often, it was the peculiar and advanced maneuverability, similar to Wall's report of the object being able to move through artillery fire that was commented on. In an attempt to explain what soldiers were seeing, some have suggested that Russia was testing new and advanced aerial technology over Korea. However, it is equally claimed that Soviet soldiers also reported encounters with similarly strange objects. If it had been of their own technology, then why were reports of unidentified flying objects being made? To many, it seemed as though the objects were not of Earth, and had come from elsewhere. What exactly did Wall and his regiment encounter that night in Korea? For decades, government bureaus have been tasked with investigating reports of unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrial contact. In the United Kingdom, this was the role of the Ministry of Defence, until the project was disbanded in 2009. In France, it remains the task of a department within the French Space Agency, known as JIPAN. In the United States, the Air Force initiated various projects. Project Sign, Project Grudge, and Project Blue Book, whose aims were not only to analyze supposed UFOs, but to assess their potential threat to national security. Whilst these investigations were highly classified at the time at which they were conducted, in recent years archived files have been released to the public under the Freedom of Information Act. One such report can be found in the CIA Reading Room. It describes an event which is said to have taken place in Siberia in 1987. The CIA report is a translation of an article which supposedly appeared in a Ukrainian newspaper in 1993. The article began by stating that after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, many previously top secret reports from the KGB, the USSR's main security agency, were leaked and found their way abroad, in particular to the CIA. It was a 250-page file concerning the activities of Russian soldiers in Siberia, which the article claimed was of particular interest to the CIA. According to the leaked materials, a quite low-flying spaceship in the shape of a saucer appeared above a military unit that was conducting routine training maneuvers. For unknown reasons, somebody unexpectedly launched a surface-to-air missile and hit the UFO. It fell to Earth not far away. The newspaper then went on to describe how the report stated that five short humanoids with large heads and large black eyes emerged from the UFO which had been shot down. After freeing themselves from the debris of the wreck, these five humanoids supposedly came close together and then merged into a single object that acquired a spherical shape. The newspaper stated that the original report included the testimonies of two of the soldiers present. They claimed that the spherical object started to buzz and hiss sharply, before turning a brilliant white. In just a few seconds, it had grown larger, and then exploded by flaring up with an extremely bright light. Twenty-three of the soldiers who had watched the phenomenon were killed in that very instant. Supposedly, they were turned into stone poles. The only survivors were two soldiers, who, due to having been standing in the shade when the explosion happened, were thought to have been shielded from the effect of its extremely bright light. It is claimed that the remains of the petrified soldiers were transported to a secret scientific research institution near Moscow. 
There it was discovered that the soldiers' living organisms had been transformed by the explosion. Their molecular composition was supposedly described as being no different from that of limestone. According to the newspaper's commentary, despite the efforts of many specialists, no explanation for the sphere or the fatal energy it emitted when it exploded could be given. The article offered its own conclusion, titling the piece Cosmic Revenge, suggesting that the Russian soldiers' attack on the UFO had caused the fatal retaliation. Whilst the CIA have not confirmed or denied whether or not the original 250-page KGB file is in their possession, or indeed exists at all, the report available in the CIA reading room does include remarks from a CIA representative. They state that if the KGB file does correspond to reality, this is an extremely menacing case. They also freely admit that the aliens possess such weapons and technology that go beyond all our assumptions, indicating that humanity has no means to defend against such an attack. Interestingly, the tone of these concluding remarks, in which the CIA refers to having made past assumptions about the aliens and their capabilities, suggests that aliens was a phenomenon known to the government agency at the time this report was produced. In the years since this report was made available to the public, mixed opinions have been offered as to its validity. Many are of the belief that this does indeed refer to a real event, citing the CIA's concealment of the report for over 20 years as proof of its genuineness. Others, however, are more skeptical. According to some UFO researchers, the report could all be misinformation on the part of the CIA, meant to present the possibility of human-alien interactions as farcical, thus undermining the validity of genuine cases. And certainly it can be said that the origins of the story are suspicious. According to the CIA report, the Ukrainian newspaper cited an article in Weekly World News as its source. The September 1992 edition in which the story first appeared provides more insight into the supposed incident, including what is described as a dramatic photo of the crash site. The author of the article claims that the photograph, as well as the 250-page KGB document, were leaked to them by two CIA insiders. Not only is the photograph published in the article dubious, but the newspaper itself has long had a controversial reputation. Many have condemned the publication as only printing fictional material. Even so, Weekly World News has traditionally claimed that it prints nothing but the truth, and is the world's only reliable newspaper. This suggests that, at the very least, their UFO story from 1992 was intended to be interpreted as a true event. Whether or not it actually correlates to reality, however, cannot be said. What is intriguing is that the CIA thought the Ukrainian newspapers reported of the case interesting enough to warrant a translation and official report being produced. After all, as their report concludes, if true, a fatal encounter between humans and aliens, in which the humans were turned to stone, is extremely menacing. In the 1940s, American Air Force pilots reported seeing strange aerial manifestations chase them all across the world. Since this was the time before UFOs were a named phenomenon, pilots dubbed them Foo Fighters, after a popular comic strip of the time, and for lack of a better name, this informal term became prevalent. In 1945, Lieutenant Donald Myers described how encounters with Foo Fighters could be typically divided into three types. The first were red balls of fire that fly along a wingtip. Then there were reports of something akin to a vertical row of three balls of fire which fly in front of the planes. Finally, there were sightings of a group of about 15 lights which appear off in the distance, like a Christmas tree up in the air, and flicker on and off. In 1944, numerous reports of unidentified objects were being handed to commanders and many were demanding explanations. 
a now declassified secret US Army memorandum dating from the 16th of January 1945 reveals how one lieutenant colonel requested support from his superiors in regards to handling the situation. We have encountered a phenomenon which we cannot explain. Crews have been followed by lights that blink on and off, changing colours, etc. The lights come very close and fly formation with our planes. His memorandum also described how crews had reported being on edge when they encountered the peculiar lights. In order to understand what they were dealing with, he stated that they needed further information from other air crews. And certainly, far from being limited to a handful of sightings, Foo Fighters were being widely encountered by US military personnel. In response, the Lieutenant Colonel received a litany of similar reports from his superiors, all of which were equally unexplained. Indeed, the reports were so numerous and ongoing that matters were escalated further until they reached the highest level, the supreme headquarters of the Allied forces. Before too long, it was realised that US forces were not alone in their experiences. British RAF pilots were also reporting encounters with bizarre lights which could change direction rapidly. Reports of Foo Fighters were numerous over continental Europe, in particular over large German cities. Similar reports were also streaming in from the Pacific and Japan. According to a news article written in 1947, the first recorded Foo Fighter witnessed in Japan was during an air raid against Tokyo. It was the 23rd of May 1945, and veteran pilot Jerry Dumphy supposedly encountered round, speedy balls of fire, fast as a B-29, but not as maneuverable. His was not the only report. Dunphy claimed that there were many other pilots who experienced similar sightings. Above all, it was the object's maneuverability which caught pilots' attentions. Not only did they exhibit dexterity far superior to Allied forces, they seemed to be improving with time. Such reports were common in many active military zones throughout the mid-1940s, to the extent that a former intelligence officer stationed in the Mariana Islands stated that they were almost a routine subject of conversation. A search of various unit records from the Pacific Theatre reveals that as many as 40 Foo Fighters were alleged to have been seen on a single mission. Without a doubt, the documentation of this phenomenon is extensive. As far as the military high command was concerned, the phenomenon was easily dismissible. After the initial wave of reports, scientists claimed to have found several explanations, ranging from pilots being exhausted, confusing the lights with the planet Venus, to a phenomenon known as St. Elmo's fire, a form of electrical discharge from the atmosphere. Yet, whilst these theories cannot be thoroughly rejected, the quantity of reports, many of them from veterans of several military campaigns, should have encouraged any researcher not to dismiss them so lightly. As one pilot stated in a newspaper at the time, if we're starting to see things now, we'd better quit and go home. The general sentiment of pilots at the time was that the dismissive handling of their reports by the higher-ups was disgusting. Beyond theories of exhaustion and natural phenomena, it has also been proposed that the mysterious objects being sighted were secret weapons developed by the enemy. However, the advanced maneuverability of the lights seemed far beyond any known technology, allied or otherwise, of the time. And, even if man-made technology could be entertained as an explanation, the similarity of descriptions of Foo Fighters in the Pacific and Europe makes this improbable. It would have been highly unlikely for German and Japanese engineers to have shared technology. It is known that despite being allies, their military cooperation was limited and cautious, and there are no documents which suggest plans for developing any long-term or real coordination of military operations. With all other explanations unconvincing, one of the most prevailing theories to explain sightings of Foo Fighters is that an unknown extraterrestrial force was observing and cataloguing human experience during one of the greatest conflicts in human history. 
Many cite the sinister nature of how the lights never physically interacted with pilots, instead choosing to keep a distance as if watching. Ultimately, the Foo Fighter phenomenon remains a mystery, and is still being researched to this day, with records and studies in other languages waiting to be translated. In time, the truth may be revealed, but for now, all we can do is speculate on what force appeared to be pursuing pilots in the midst of that titanic conflict. On the 18th of October 1973, an Army Reserve helicopter and its crew of four men were flying above the state of Ohio. In command of the helicopter in the right front seat was Captain Lawrence J. Coyne. At 36 years of age, Coyne had 19 years of flying experience. The helicopter and its crew were stationed at Cleveland Hopkins Airport, and at around 11 o'clock that evening, they were returning to their base from Columbus. What happened during this return flight was supposedly so bizarre that Coyne was forced to file an official report in detail to the army. The helicopter was cruising at 2,500 feet and they were alone. A check showed that none of the unit's Super Sabre jets were in the air. It should have been a routine flight. Yet, at that moment, the helicopter's crew chief supposedly noticed the appearance of a red light on the eastern horizon. During an interview with a local newspaper two weeks after the incident, Coyne explained how the light was travelling in excess of 600 knots. In about 10 seconds, the unidentified light had travelled from the horizon to the helicopter. Coyne was in no doubt that they and the object he described as the other craft were on a collision course. The pilot then put the helicopter into a dive. According to Coyne's testimony, the helicopter crew prepared themselves for impact at around 1,700 feet. The unidentified object was claimed to be terrifically fast, giving Coyne and his crew little time to respond. Yet, there was no crash. Coyne alleged that before it hit the helicopter, the object stopped right over them. Now so close, he said he was able to get a better look at the mysterious craft. In his interview, he provided a detailed description. It had a big grey metallic looking hull around 60 feet long. It was shaped like an airfoil or a streamlined fat cigar. There was a red light on the front. The leading edge glowed red a short distance back from the nose. There was a center dome, a green light at the rear reflected on the hull. The green light at the rear supposedly swiveled like a spotlight. When it pointed at the helicopter, Coyne stated that the beam of light came through the canopy of the helicopter and bathed the inside of the cabin in a green glow. Without any input from himself or members of his crew, the helicopter began to climb. In just a couple of seconds, the military aircraft had climbed from 1,700 to 3,500 feet, with no power, no guidance from the crew, and no G-forces or other noticeable strains. After this, the unidentified craft seemed to release the helicopter before moving off to the west and out of sight. In the aftermath of this bizarre encounter, Coyne was not the only one to discuss what had happened that autumn evening. Other members of his crew have confirmed his original testimony, with all four signing the official army report. Not only that, several members of the public on the ground below also reported witnessing the soldiers near miss with the unidentified craft. Writing about what he saw 45 years later, Jim Carver explains how he, his father and brother, were standing at a kitchen window in their home near Mansfield, Ohio. According to his testimony, it was his brother Bill who first noticed red, green and white lights on the horizon. Following their movement with a pair of binoculars, Carver claims that the unidentified flying object got closer to his house. In the hope of getting a better view, he got in his car and drove towards Mansfield. Little did he know that in doing so, he would miss what has been described as one of the most credible UFO events in history. 
From the ground, Carver's brother, father and neighbours watched in horror as the UFO shot across the sky towards the helicopter. It seemed a certainty that they were about to witness a horrific collision. Yet, instead, they claimed that they saw the helicopter successfully dive to avoid the other craft, with both then climbing straight up in the air at speed. Sitting in his car now a few blocks away, Carver supposedly witnessed the UFO shoot off towards the northwest. In his own words, in literally seconds it was the size of a star in the distance. Even faster, the object disappeared from sight. Carver was left with no doubt that what he, his family and neighbours witnessed that night was distinctly not from this world. As for Coyne and his crew, they maintained that they had encountered an unidentified flying object, labelling it as such in their official report. Whether or not the strange craft was alien in nature, however, remains a mystery. Whatever the case may be, an irrefutable explanation has never been provided. Bill Brooks is a former British Army soldier who was born in 1950. For two thirds of his life, he did not believe in aliens, UFOs, or anything paranormal. All this changed at the age of 44. It was then that Brooks experienced what he has described as a sudden download of memories. Memories which, until that point, he had supposedly suppressed and kept hidden deep within his subconscious mind. At first, it was one memory in particular which anchored firmly within his mind. Over the next twenty years, others would gradually resurface, until Brooks was left in no doubt that on several occasions over the course of his life, he had been abducted by aliens. After experiencing a series of heart attacks and strokes in the course of a single week in 2012, Brooks was left with the pressing need to share his experiences with others. It was his belief that it was important for humanity to understand what he had experienced. This sentiment culminated in the publication of a book in 2016. In his book, Brooks alleges that his extraterrestrial experiences dated back to his childhood, and that even after his moment of awakening, when he realised his history of abductions at the age of 44, he continued to be abducted. At one point, he describes having watched the Earth getting smaller and smaller through a window on a spaceship during a childhood abduction. After this point, his awareness of the event became muddled, with Brooks suggesting that his memory may have been wiped by the aliens. Missing time and confusion in regards to the chronology of events feature throughout Brooks' testimonies. On another occasion, he describes having found himself sitting on a path in the pitch dark with no recollection of anything at all. His last memory was of being there several hours earlier. Such claims of missing time are common amongst others who claim to be alien abductees. Soon after graduating from army training, Brooks was posted overseas to a high security nuclear regiment in Germany. One night, whilst trying to sleep on top of an armoured vehicle after a cancelled military exercise, Brooks and his friend Joe were supposedly disturbed by light and smoke. The smoke was said to be similar to that of a flare, with the lights being almost blindingly bright and white. The scene which he claims to have watched unfold thereafter made absolutely no sense to Brooks whatsoever. He describes how he and Joe watched in disbelief as their fellow soldiers, as if under orders, began leaving the vehicles they had been sleeping soundly in. Appearing to be in a trance, the men moved en masse towards some object with very bright lights in the field. Brooks points out that despite being exhausted from a long day of exercise, the men moved in perfect unison. Climbing down from the top of the vehicle in an attempt to investigate, Brooks was then supposedly confronted by a man dressed in black coveralls. He was armed, and forcefully instructed Brooks to walk towards the light. In the end, both Brooks and Joe were made to do as the man commanded. Once again, Brooks claims that his memory of what followed is murky. The next morning, he and Joe found themselves standing on parade with no recollection of the night before, or indeed how they got on parade. 
Whilst Brooks affirms that he has no memory of what happened that night, after being confronted by the man in black, he was left wondering whether he and his fellow soldiers had been part of a mass abduction. Brooks's book is packed with similarly sensational stories. As well as discussing his alleged abduction experiences, he also describes how he had to have two implants removed from his body after an abduction. Understandably, Brooks's accounts are difficult to digest, with Brooks himself acknowledging the incredible nature of his experiences. All that said, he is far from alone in his claims. Reports of alien abductions, whilst rare, do exist, and have been surprisingly well documented by various researchers. Ultimately, Brooks has stated that he can only share his story and let others decide what to think of it. When asked if he believes extraterrestrials pose a threat to mankind during an interview, he stated, I haven't got the foggiest idea in reality, but why all the secrecy? Could it be that this British soldier experienced a lifetime of abductions, including during active military service? Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this and haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe for more of the paranormal. To receive notifications of new videos, make sure you have clicked the bell icon next to my subscription box. And if you missed my last video on time slips, why not take a look at it now using the link on screen. Until next time.